So, what were we doing yesterday? Uh, looking at what uh, third order op amp in uh, feedback loop behaves like and to analyze this in general where you have an arbitrary third order system with poles everywhere it is quite difficult. So, we settle for the easier option where the op amp is modeled as having three poles all at the same location ok. Then what do we do as usual we find v naught by v i which is that much. Now, the question is can this have any roots in the right half line or can this closed loop system be unstable. So, it will be unstable if the poles are not strictly in the left half plane, if it is on the imaginary axis or uh, in the right half plane. I think by now you already know at least one of the techniques to figure this out the Ruth Herbert's criterion. What other uh, techniques have you discussed? You are in the middle of that ok. So, with that also you will find the answer that yes it can have uh, although all coefficients are positive the third uh, for a third order system that does not guarantee stability for a second order system it does right. All coefficients of s are positive here, but you do find that uh, for some values of uh, a naught by k it will become unstable and what is that boundary? a naught by k more than 8 means unstable system ok huh? ah, greater than or equal to yeah, that is correct. And how did y do it? How did we do it? If you did not know Ruth Hurwitz you could still check one particular case where the roots are on the imaginary axis ok. So, if you assume that if you call this denominator d of s, d of uh, s is 0 for some s equals j omega naught you will get two equations one that says the real part is 0 the other that says the imaginary part is 0. Okay. From those two you can find the conditions right you will find that so this tells you that a naught by k equals 8 and also you will know what the unstable roots are right you will know that omega naught is how much square root 3 p 1 ok. So, that tells you I mean it is not very useful while building an amplifier, but if it did oscillate where would it oscillate that is what it is telling you ok. Now, the remarkable thing here is that you are limited to a loop gain of 8 let us say we had got like 8 million or something then we will say oh, ok we will live with it we will uh, always stick to something in the hundred thousands and that is good enough for us, but this is so this is such a useless value of loop gain that you cannot do anything with this ok. So, we have to find some way to fix the situation if the poles are separated things will be mitigated somewhat, but still uh, as you go to higher and higher number of uh, poles you will have this problem ok. By the way in the second order case also you saw that when the poles were on top of each other it was the worst case right that is when the damping factor was the least. In that case there is no outright instability, but at least it is the worst behaved when uh, the poles are on top of each other. Here also when uh, three poles are on top of each other you need just a loop gain of weight DC loop gain of weight to make it unstable ok. And similarly, if you go to a larger number of poles you can figure out like very small values of a naught by k can render the system unstable. So, this is not some uh, value of DC loop gain we can live with. So, we have to find a fix. So, how do we do it? One thing that is out of question is sitting and calculating roots of polynomials ok. This was difficult enough already right. So, we do not want to do that. So, what we do is the following. What did we learn from uh, first and second order systems? The first order system is unconditionally stable, ok. This is the phase 
and the second order system is well behaved if it behaves more or less like the first order system right so something like that was well behaved now what we calculated was that the second pole must be four times the unity loop gain frequency uh, four times the gain bandwidth product okay in fact i will call this omega u loop and p2 must be four times omega u loop okay again it doesn't have to be exactly four times but you can clearly see that it can't be less than omega u loop okay that will give a very small damping factor so you expect that this pole p2 has to be beyond the unity loop gain frequency so at least equal to the unity loop gain frequency and beyond that and what does the phase response look like in that case so it will uh, start from 0 uh, go to minus 90 degrees and then finally end up at minus 180 degrees okay huh? oh this is the plot of the loop gain sorry actually i should have made this uh, a naught by k thanks so these are the loop gain magnitude and phase plots okay we saw that this is of importance because the unity loop gain frequency also decides the closed loop bandwidth and so on. So, the stability is not C. Let me take this particular uh, system with which you are quite familiar. What is Y by U for this system? G by 1 plus G H. Okay. So, let us say I had another input here u 1, what would be y by u 1? I will add it here. What would it be? Huh? No, I do not even want the contribution of u, I want only the contribution of u 1, what is it? Yeah, it is minus g h by 1 plus g h, the way I have it. So, this is minus g h by 1 plus g h. Let us say I take an output here y 1, what would be y 1 by u? y 1 by u, what is it? Hey, you can mentally imagine some other g and h, right? You can uh, redraw the block diagram with uh, some other g and some other h. What is that? 1 by 1 plus h, that is correct. And similarly, y 1 by u 1. minus h by 1 plus h ok. So, the exact transfer function depends on uh, where you apply the input and where you take the output always ok and this is true in circuits also at the uh, zeros of the system will depend on where you apply the input and where you take the output, but the poles do not the characteristic of the system itself does not and here you can kind of see that uh, 1 plus gh is in the denominator everywhere ok. So, the rest of the stuff only influences the zeros. So, uh, once you have this negative feedback loop either it is stable or it is not stable I mean you cannot say that oh I will apply the input here then it will be stable but if I apply it there it will be unstable no 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 it will be either stable or unstable and you can see that the loop gain appears in the denominator and if gh is minus 1 all of them will definitely be unstable because the gain will be infinity for some frequency ok is this fine. So, what we do when we look at uh, when we try to study stability is not the exact not the specific closed loop transfer function, but the loop gain of the system ok, because you can apply the input anywhere take the output elsewhere you will get a different transfer function, but the loop gain will not change as long as you have not changed the feedback loop itself ok, this is fine ok. Then, What is a condition? So, let us say the loop gain L of s is g of s h of s ok and I told you that 
any transfer function in the feedback system, you apply the input anywhere, take the output anywhere, you will end up with 1 plus gh in the denominator, okay. Now, can you tell me one particular, uh, what is that, should I say constraint? So, one particular case of loop gain where the system will be unstable or where the system will have, uh, the closed loop system will have roots on the imaginary axis. We have done this for the specific third order system, but uh, what should happen to the loop gain? So, that the closed loop system will have at least one pair of poles on the imaginary axis. You understand the question? What happens if the poles of some system are on the imaginary axis? Huh? That is correct. So, what does it mean? I mean, for what? That is correct. So, if the roots are on the imaginary axis, it means that the gain for some sinusoidal input is infinity. Okay. So, when you substitute s equal to j omega, you are exciting the system with sinusoidal inputs, right. h of j omega is nothing but the steady state gain for a sinusoidal input of frequency omega, okay. So, if the poles are on the imaginary axis, obviously, when you apply that frequency, the gain should be infinity, that is the meaning of the pole, right. So, that means that h of j omega, uh, the closed loop uh, gain is infinity for some value of, some value of omega, okay. So, what does this say about the loop gain? So, it says that basically L of j omega is minus 1 for some omega, okay. So, remember this is only for the poles being on the imaginary axis. The system will be unstable if the poles are on the in the right half plane also. In that case, you will not have this condition, okay. But if the poles are on the imaginary axis, then uh, L of j omega equals minus 1 for that particular that particular uh, uh, frequency, okay. Is this clear? At least it must be clear that if the loop gain is minus 1 for any frequency, then the system will be unstable, okay. And what can you say if, uh, L of s is minus 1 for s equals j omega naught. First of all, it means that the system is unstable and secondly, it has roots at s equals plus minus j omega naught, okay. This is the closed loop, uh, this refers to the closed loop system. In fact, this is exactly what we used to find out the instability condition for the third order case, right. Huh? What is that? No, so what I meant here, I did not write it completely. This has poles at, now what I mean is, if L of s is minus 1 for this particular frequency, that means that the poles are at that frequency, right, is not it? If L of s is minus 1 for any s, that is correct, but we are using sinusoidal steady state analysis to carry out our calculation. So, we have to use something on the imaginary axis, yeah. L of s, yeah, what he is saying is if L of s is minus 1 for any s, well, what does that mean actually? I am not sure if uh, it is even possible for any other s which is not imaginary for it to be minus 1. No, no, that is, yeah, I mean that does, that is not correct actually, because it will be, I mean you can always find some s for which it will be, the denominator will be 0, right, that is just the pole of the system. If the pole happens to be in the left half plane, then it is a stable system. If it is on the imaginary axis or the right half plane, it is an unstable system, okay. Oh, yeah, any? What will blow up? The natural response will blow up, yeah, that is correct. No, no, see, if you have a transfer function h of s, you will be able to find some s for which this will be infinity, right, that is the pole, okay, but that does not mean it is unstable, 
okay so if that value if that pole lies in the left half plane strictly it is stable if it's in on the imaginary axis or the right half plane it will be unstable okay so the inter our uh, so this this means that there are roots on the imaginary axis and this is definitely an unstable case and also this is something that we can either simulate or measure using sinusoidal steady state analysis or phasor analysis okay this is how we calculated the instability of third order system right so the point here is l of s shouldn't become minus 1 for any sinusoidal input any s equal to j omega whatever okay so roughly speaking the rule for stability by the way all this is well founded these things can be derived from theory but i'm not doing it here because it will take too much time so i will give you some uh, rules by which you can ensure that ensure stability in a higher order system but in control systems you will see something what is known as a nyquist plot okay so all of what i'm saying can be derived from that okay so you know that i mean how many of you have taken complex analysis yeah so you know there are all kinds of uh, interesting theorems right so if the poles are here and if you go around the circle around that then something else happens and you can do all kinds of mapping between different complex planes and so on so this it turns out that uh i won't go into the details of this this is the s plane okay so it turns out that let's say there are some uh closed loop poles in the right half plane this can be figured out without trying to calculate the closed loop transfer function which is difficult right once you calculate the closed loop transfer function factorizing it finding the roots all that is very difficult it turns out that you don't even have to calculate the closed loop transfer function you just have to plot l of s l of uh, sorry you evaluate l of s on the imaginary axis and then you plot the real versus or imaginary versus real part of that okay so it turns out that if this has certain number of poles in the right half plane then this will give you some funny curve it can be anything so it will do something like that it will be some stuff so the number of times it goes around this minus 1 0 will be the same as the number of uh, poles in the right half plane okay you may have seen similar results in complex numbers where you integrate around some contour and you count some things inside this will make it lot easier to carry out the integration than the brute force integration right so if you have done this complex analysis you will know this but this can be derived even uh, otherwise so you will be able to see this in uh, control system so so i won't go into all of this but what you see here is the importance of minus 1 0 and that you can intuitively understand right if the loop gain becomes minus 1 for some uh, sinusoid it will be unstable so essentially the goal of uh, your uh, i mean the stability criterion simply says that you keep away from minus 1 that's all you keep the loop gain away from minus 1 right is it okay so in fact let me illustrate it further by taking the third order system this is the loop gain of the amplifier with three poles right three identical poles what will the what a plot of the loop gain look like ha huh? what's that Let's get it. What is it? Ah, sixty degree per second. So it will start with a naught by k as usual, and it will drop off at minus sixty db per decade. Okay. And what happens to phase? What is the phase like at p one? Minus minus three pi by four minus uh, minus three pi by four, right? Yeah, this is correct, isn't it? Minus one thirty five degrees. So it does. By the way, let. 
let me also show the second order sir this is minus 40 and the phase minus 180 okay now first of all you can see that in the second order case can the loop gain ever be minus 1 in the second order case can you have a loop gain of minus 1 yes or no why not in the second order case in the blue case can i have a loop gain of minus 1 this is the magnitude and phase of the loop gain can i or can i not have it no 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 this is the loop gain just look at it and tell me can the loop gain be minus 1 why not this is not the closed loop transfer function man this is the loop gain can this value be minus 1 Huh? Exactly, the phase is never exactly equal to minus 180, so it can't possibly be minus one, or it asymptotically goes to minus 180 when uh, the frequency is infinity. But when the frequency is infinity, the magnitude is nearly ze magnitude is zero, right? So this will never be minus one. That's another way to think about why the second order system cannot be unstable. Okay, it can be very bad, but it cannot be unstable. What about the third order system? Can you have? Can you somehow? adjust the parameters of the third order system so that the loop gain is exactly minus 1. Clearly you can do that right. So, you look first look at where it is cutting minus 180 degrees ok and then you see exactly what the magnitude is at that point. I can always adjust a naught by k so that that becomes 1 ok. And in particular, in our case, you know that this uh, minus 180 degrees it occurred when it was p1 times square root of 3, right? Slightly more than p1. And if a0 by k equals 8, then it becomes unstable, okay? Then the loop gain becomes minus 1. Is this clear or not? I am not getting any feedback from the class. So. Is it okay? Now, we know that. it is unstable if a naught by k equals 8. Now, there is another uh, principle that is also true. If the loop gain does not have any zeros, then if you find some value of a naught by k for which it is unstable, then for all higher values of a naught by k, it will also be unstable. Okay? So, this is really the upper limit. This again can be derived uh, properly. Okay, so this is true. By the way, only if the loop gain doesn't have any zeros. So we will kind of uh, hand wave that thing, and once in a while use it when it has zeros at very high frequencies. But if the loop gain doesn't have any zeros, then it is unstable for all. higher values of a naught by k. Okay. What we are trying to do is to bypass this business of calculating anything involving polynomials. That is very difficult, that is just not possible. Okay. But uh, sinusoidal steady state response is easy to calculate, measure, you can go to the lab, you just stick a sinusoid. You do not care whether it is uh, fifth order or tenth order, you can measure it, but calculating it, I mean calculating the polynomial stuff is very complicated. Okay? So, we will see how to do that. So, like I said, so this business of stability is about avoiding the point minus 1, I mean avoiding uh, having a loop gain of minus 1. Okay? Now, this is the frequency at which the loop gain magnitude is 1, right? P1 can be complex, yeah. but P1, when you have complex uh, poles, you can do the analysis, but Bode plot is not a good way of uh, approximating the characteristics, that is all. Because when P1 is itself complex, you could have peaking and so on. 
this asymptotic straight line stuff is a good approximation only when you have real poles and zeros. But that is only about the this kind of plot, I mean you can always plot it exactly and do everything that is fine. Possibly, yeah. yeah. No, how? No, no, that's okay. But uh, yeah, it may be possible yeah, in some cases. Although, I mean, for the kind of model that we have assumed, I don't think it's possible. So this corresponds to this is the frequency at which the magnitude is one. Okay. And if the phase was here, okay, at this red dot, then it would correspond to loop gain of minus one. Okay. So basically, what we say is instead of uh, trying to find the poles and uh, so on, and making sure that they are in the uh, left half plane, we will simply calculate the loop gain and say that when the loop gain magnitude is one the phase should not have gone down as low as minus 180 degrees. Okay. So, we know that it is unstable when it is minus 180 degrees. The other things we have not proved, but it can be proved and we will use that. Okay. So, that means that there has to be some clearance here. The phase should not have gone down as far as minus 180 degrees when the loop gain magnitude is 1. Okay. All the earlier stuff that I said is to give you some motivation for this. I did not want to simply throw the uh, result at you, at least you should understand that the loop gain being exactly minus 1, that is unit magnitude and 180 uh, minus 180 degrees phase, that will mean instability. Okay. So, now this is an additional thing that I am bringing in and this is exactly true for all pole systems and when you have 0, sometimes it can be true and so on. So, what I am now saying is that uh, the loop, when the loop gain magnitude is 1, you can have phase lag, but it should not be as much as minus 180 degrees. Okay. Is this fine? So, that is the stability criterion that we use and now once we couch it that way, it does not matter whether we have like 3 poles or 30. Okay. All you have to do is calculate the sinusoidal steady state response for which there are many ways to do. Okay. You can just do it by a circuit analysis, phasor analysis for instance. If you had a circuit with uh, 20 capacitors and 10 inductors, you can still do phasor analysis. It may be a little cumbersome, but you can still do it. Whereas, uh, calculating a polynomial and calculating its roots, I mean it is immensely complicated or maybe not even possible. Okay. This is fine. So, that is for stability. So, it will be unstable, the poles will be in the right half plane. Okay. So, that is the exact result that you will see in control systems. So, what happens is, so let us say that that is why I showed the third order example. The phase plot will remain the same regardless of the value of A0 by k, right. Whatever value of A0 by k I have, this phase plot here, this black stuff here, this will remain the same. Okay. So, let us start with very, very small values of A0 by k or maybe A0 by k equal to 1. Okay. So, this corresponds to A0 by k equal to 1, that is a DC loop gain of 1, completely useless negative feedback system, but just for illustration. Will this be unstable? Clearly not. You can evaluate the roots and you will find that everything is in the left half plane. Okay. And also clearly, when the gain is unity, the phase is only 0 degrees or some small volume. Okay. As you go on increasing the DC loop gain, you can do this and you can do that and so on. So, what happens is you evaluate the phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency. So, it will increase, it will go on increasing, right. So, at some point it will become exactly minus 180 degrees. So, at that point it will be, the system will become unstable 
and it will have the closed loop system will have poles on the imaginary axis. As you increase the DC loop gain beyond that, th that is the condition that you mentioned. So, at the unity loop gain frequency, the phase lag will be more negative than minus 180 degrees. At that point, it turns out that the, pole, the poles of the closed loop systems will be in the right half plane. Okay. So, it will be unstable and that result is exact for uh, all pole systems. When the loop gain has only poles and no zeros, that result is exact. Okay. Any questions about this? So, what I tried to show is having loop gain of minus 1 is of course dangerous because it will mean outright instability. So, you have to keep away from that point and what do you mean by keeping away? When the loop gain magnitude becomes 1, the phase lag should not have been as much as minus 180, as much as 180 degrees. Okay. And this unity loop gain frequency is nothing but omega u loop. Is this fine? Now, like I have been uh, saying earlier, we not only want stability, that is, uh, we want the poles to be in the left half plane, that is for sure, we also want a clean settling behavior, right. We do not want the response to ring like 100 times before settling and so on. Okay. In the second order case, it was easy to quantify this. That was the damping factor. We just said that the damping factor should be 1 or half or some thereabouts and we were fine. What do you do for a higher order system? What we do is the following. Now, hopefully you are already convinced that this phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency is an important quantity to look at and it should not be as much as minus 180 degrees. Okay. So, we will go one step further and say that the phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency should be the same as a well behaved second order system. Okay. So, I see that you are all like uh, super bored. So, <laughs> please calculate the phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency for a second order system with damping factor of half. Okay. So, phase lag of the loop gain L of j omega for a second order system whose closed loop damping factor, you can do it for two different values zeta equal to 1 and zeta equal to half. Okay. So, you please calculate at the unity loop gain frequency what will be the phase lag okay. and you can make the usual approximation that a naught by k is much more than 1 and so on. Okay. If you have a second order loop gain what is the phase lag of this at some s equals j omega, what is that? What is it? Minus tan inverse, tan inverse of what? Omega by p 1 minus tan inverse omega by p 2. So, this is just what you have to calculate that is all with omega being the unity loop gain frequency. So, what are the answers you get? The loop gain is a naught by k 1 plus s by p 1 1 plus s by p 2. Okay. And we had the expression for the damping factor earlier, what was it? Half square root p 1 by p 2 plus square root p 2 by p 1 times square root of k by a naught. Now, I already told you that you can assume a large DC loop gain that is large value of a naught by k. Okay. So, in that case you already know that these two have to be far apart from each other p 1 and p 2. Okay. So, for zeta equal to 1 you had already calculated this, what was it? 
P2 was 4 times A0 by K times P1 and what is this whole quantity? 4 times the unity loop gain frequency, okay. And for Z equal to half, what do you get? This 4 goes away, you simply have A0 by K times P1, 4 times omega U loop, okay. So, this is what, yeah, this is just uh, omega U loop. Now, if P2 falls below this, if P2 falls below the unity loop gain frequency, the damping factor reduces even further, okay. So, that we will say is unacceptable, right. So, that is not a, then you will have a severely underdamped system and you do not want that, okay. So, that is why I said this uh, extra pole should be beyond the unity loop gain frequency, okay. So, now you can calculate what is the phase lag of this minus tan inverse omega u loop by P1 minus tan inverse omega u loop by P2. This is the phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency, okay. Again assuming that A0 by K was large to begin with, what will be this number? Minus pi by 2, okay. This pole, the first pole always gives you a 90 degrees phase lag because there is so much separation between first and second poles. By the time you reach anywhere near the second pole, the first pole has given you a 90 degrees phase lag, okay. And this is true for most negative feedback systems. In a significant region of frequencies, the phase lag of the loop gain will be minus 90 degrees, okay. The second one is what you have to calculate and that for Z equal to 1, you will get minus tan inverse 1 by 4, okay. And how much is that? 14 degrees or so. So, the total phase lag is, how much is the total phase lag? Minus 104 degrees and for this case, what do you get? Minus 135 degrees, okay. So, roughly speaking, this is the kind of phase lag that you can tolerate, okay. You can have a phase lag of 91 degrees also, right. That will be fine. That is just beyond 90, but what you will see later is that the expense is enormous, okay. You will have to end up dissipating a lot of power in the circuit to be able to achieve that, okay. That is basically become almost like a first order system, right. If you have only minus 90 degrees, that is first order. If you make the second order such that it is 91 degrees, that means it is very, very close to first order. You do not need to go to that extremes. It is okay if the phase lag is somewhere between these, right. And in fact, the number that we quote is not this, but the complement of that. As I have been saying many times, uh, the first thing that you learn in control system is how to see whether it is stable or not. But if it is just inside the left half plane, it will be stable. But for a circuit design or for any design, you need to know how stable it is. And this is necessarily a way criterion, right. This is something like margin. This is a stability margin that you have. So, what we use to characterize stability margin is this difference between phase lag and minus 180 degrees and that is known as the phase margin, okay. And it is a appropriate term that means that if the, if there was extra phase lag inside the feedback loop equal to this much, it would become unstable, okay. So, a second order system with a damping factor of 1 has a phase margin of how much? What is the phase margin? 76 degrees, right. So, that means that if there is, there is like 76 more degrees of phase shift somehow in the loop, it will become unstable and it is not very likely. 76 degrees is a lot. And for damping factor of 1, we serve 45 degrees. So, roughly speaking, somewhere between these two is what you take and one number that is frequently quoted is 60 degrees. Again, everything is dependent on the context, right. But if you are given no further information and asked to design a negative feedback system, you design it for 60 degree phase margin and move on, right. Because there are useful th uh, systems which I have also designed circuits which will have phase margin of 30 degrees. That is also okay. It is slightly more under damped, but that is fine. But you can get a sense that a phase margin of 1 degrees is not okay, right. At the unity loop gain frequency, you will have 179 degrees of phase shift. You have one more degree, you blow on the circuit and it will start oscillating. So, the margin is basically what it is, right. And any definition of margin always has some sense of. Uh, vagueness to it because it is also a matter of personal taste. I am sure like uh, many of you leave from here uh, 2 hours before the train leaves central and maybe some of you leave like 45 minutes before. So, it is up to you, the margin is up to you. But uh, 
of course, it has its implications. If you do this like a million times, the ones who live 45, 45 minutes before will miss the train. So, similarly, if you go on designing feedback uh, systems with 20 degrees of phase margin, some of them will give you serious trouble, okay. Or it could be that you design it for 25 degree, uh, I mean uh, 20 degrees of phase margin at room temperature, you heat it up or cool it down, at some point it can oscillate and so on, because everything varies with temperature also, okay. So, uh, that is, there is some uh, uncertainty, I mean some uh, vagueness about the margin or rather something that is context dependent about the margin, but once you have the context you know what the phase margin is and you can uh, you can design it for them, okay. So, what we have tried to do is to have stability criterion in terms of loop gain, not in terms of the closed loop poles because that is very hard to evaluate, whereas loop gain itself is quite easy to evaluate, you just do phasor analysis of your circuit or sinusoidal steady state analysis of your circuit to do that. And how do you ascertain stability? We said that, I mean we kind of uh, progressed from first to second to third order and saw that first order system unconditionally stable, second order system unconditionally stable, but well behaved if it behaves more or less like a first order system where the loop gain is significant. Once the loop gain falls below one, anything can happen and you will be fine, okay. And third order also, now we no longer have the, for second order we even calculated the exact result, for third order we do not even bother, it can be proved, but I did not prove it here that if it, uh, if the uh, magnitude and phase plot of the loop gain look more or less like what it does for the second order, meaning you now we use the phase margin as the quantity, if it has the same phase margin as a well behaved second order system, the third order system will also be well behaved, okay. Is this fine? Let us see if we can do this quickly. So, let me take a third order system whose loop gain is I take one pole P1 and two other identical poles again for convenience, okay. So, what I want to find out now is location of P2 such that the phase margin is 74 degrees, okay. This is not difficult, it may be, it may take longer to read it than to calculate it, but. Uh, you understand what I am saying? So, what this means is that so let me overlay the loop gain of a third order system, it could be something like that, okay. And the phase also will do something of the sort and it will fall off to minus 270 degrees. What I want to know is where should this pole be such that the phase lag at the unity loop gain frequency is minus 104 degrees or phase margin is 74 degrees. A not P1 by? Yeah, yeah, you please calculate the number and tell me. 7 times, why? I mean, why 7? I mean, you could have made a better guess than that. Is that right? Okay. I would have just said 8. With one pole, it is 4 and two poles, it is 8. <laughs> so, again, uh, this again we will discuss the unity loop gain frequency of this will also be A naught by k times P1, okay, because the poles have to occur well beyond the unity loop gain frequency. So, this will contribute 90 degrees and these two together will have to contribute 14 degrees. So, each one should contribute 7 degrees, okay. From that you can, no, phase margin is 76 degrees, sorry, yeah, it is uh, it's the same as the damping factor, that is why I think otherwise we will get 8.1 probably. <laughs> Okay, please think about this, we will continue.